many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there, the space is there, and we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there, and new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure of which man has ever embarked. great stories start with in the beginning. This story, too, will start with in the beginning. Except in this story, in the beginning, there was emptiness. Or there was everything. Or just potential energy. What Genesis points out and focuses us on is the most important thing that is important for us in our reality, in our universe, and that is time. Time is what allowed us to have our universe reorganize itself to everything that we know, to change. And yes, we are that little dot that you see, and this is only one part of everything that's around us. If you look at the evolution of where we are at, or look at Genesis, you could break it up into six main steps. One, the creation of matter and space, light and darkness, the separation between gas and dust, but what's really important is what occurs in step three. That is the creation of supercontinents, super oceans, life in the waters that lead to photosynthesis, that then on step four create an atmosphere. That atmosphere allows us to see the sun, the moon, and the ability to have simple animals develop. Those simple animals developed into mammals, and what's really critical about this beautiful creation is me. <laughs> it is important, because if it wasn't for me, I wouldn't be here. 
I wouldn't be here to speak to you, and I wouldn't be able to give you my vision of how this story goes. But seriously, what's important is our interest. If you look at these pictures, you'll see me trying to be a rabbit, or me trying to be an artist. But what's really critical is that humankind as a whole wants to explore. Explore what's out there. If we look at our evolution and what we're doing to the world around us, you could see that disruptive events lead to new opportunities. Those events could be seen on islands where you have multiple species evolve to different niches that are available. They could also be technology as it develops when a new technology develops and new applications are discovered for it. Studying biology and technology, you could observe that when something works, you are able to standardize it. Standardization allows the evolution process to move faster. In this example, you start with a wheel. The standard of a wheel gets changed over time, and through selection, we end up with the modern tire that is on every car. So furthermore, standardization allows us to predict an outcome. But the ability, the flexibility, to be able to change things, to do experiments, is risk. And so if you modulize what you do, you're able to gain the benefit of both, standardization and the flexibility of customization. Examples, Model T and modern car manufacturing. Each station is a module. All of us know about computers. This presentation is run on a computer. The computer is built on modules, a video card, a motherboard, et cetera. Open sources, open source software, open source hardware depend on standardization. But why I'm here and what is my curiosity is space. And in space, there are also modules. For example, the CubeSat NanoSat platform that allows industry, universities, and even, yes, high school and elementary schools to dream of flying their experiments up to space. We always dream of space, even at the worst moment in our history. The picture that you see on the left was drawn by a kid who was in a concentration camp, visioning what it would be like to be on the moon and to see Earth. We've, science fiction has looked at creation of space stations and shuttles, and we follow that and created vehicles that launch animals to space, humans to space, and yes, we even landed on the moon. But looking at space, we find out that the lack of gravity and other things changes biology in space. We could see moss or plants that normally grow against gravity. Without gravity, they grow into spirals. Muscle loss, bone loss, immune changes, the ability for one organism to interact with another, all change in space. We also know that everywhere we look in space, the moon, some asteroids, Mars, they're the building blocks of life, water, organic material, and trace elements. We used to think we were unique, a planet in a solar system. When we observe and look out into the universe, everywhere we look, we see potential planets. So being a planet isn't unique. But if we are to get there, we have to solve one major question. Current technology says we need to fly 11 metric tons of life support material to sustain life. This is not the answer. 
So the answer has to come either from science fiction or from our past. And our past in our history, when man evolved and went to new environments, they didn't carry the house or the whole village with them. What they did is they took seeds. And they took the seeds and grew the food source to the new locations. So biology allows you to explore without the problems of carrying everything with you. If biology changes in space, how are we going to assure our survival when we go out to space? How is that going to occur? Humans finally gained direct access to the genetic code. Deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. Since then, we've cut and pasted it, photocopied fragments of it en masse, sped read it with sequences, printed out the code letter by letter in the lab, modelled it on computers and measured it with microscopes. For 40 years now, we've called this work genetic engineering. The trouble is that while there's been an extraordinary amount of genetic discovery and manipulation, there's been precious little engineering. Engineers are frustrated by genetics and molecular biology. The experiments are too slow, the complexity too messy, and growing more so all the time, and there's a frustrating lack of standardised components. They'd like to do to genetic engineering what engineers have done since the Stone Age. Collect, refine, and repackage nature so that it's easier to make new and reliable things. Engineers want to treat DNA more like a programming language. Instead of ones and zeros, A's, T's, G's and C's. They want to use DNA to write simple, Lego-like functional components, inspired by, but not found in nature, and then run them in a cell instead of a computer. The only difference is this software builds its own hardware. They call this re-engineered genetic engineering synthetic biology. Nowadays, rather than cut and paste the DNA sequence out of one organism and into another, you can, if you know what you're doing, just type your DNA sequence into a computer, or copy it from a database, or even select from a growing component catalogue. And then you just order it over the internet. Yes, really. The DNA sequence may be copied from nature, but the DNA itself is made by a machine. It's synthetic. Already engineers have assembled an open source catalogue of over 5,000 standardised components, called biobricks. In the last 10,000 years, genetics has taken us from gathering seeds to manipulating DNA. And engineering has taken us from rocks and caves to handheld computers and skyscrapers. We can only guess what the two working together as synthetic biology may help us achieve in the future. But the possibilities are breathtaking. Engineering algae that can eat climate-changing carbon dioxide and produce less polluting biofuels. We might do away with both liver and kidney transplants and instead use a vat-grown, all-purpose biological sieve organ called a cliver. We could change the nature of construction, architecture, urban planning, forestry, and even gardening, with a seed that can grow into a house. So from biology to biology, if we are to explore space, explore the universe, what we must be able to do is harness what nature has already done, and that is millions of years of evolution. Take that and be able to use that to faraway places. For space exploration, it means that we could carry with us a universal cell that gets grown in space, in locations, for multiple purposes, like life support, like food, 
like the ability to have medications on demand. The DNA sequence can be beamed to anywhere and be produced at the location. But further than that, let's take biology out of biology. Let's use biology to help us use the resources that are at the location to build houses. To go further than that, currently, the vision of space, of how we carry space, is to have what you could say, tin cans in space. You have a metal structure in space that we fly with, and that is the structure that was identified in the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. So now imagine taking biology and having a spacecraft that is part biology, or maybe completely biology, that could adapt as you're moving from one destination to another, can repair its skin if it gets hit by a micrometeor. More importantly, let's even imagine even further than that, the actual propulsion could be biological-based. There are ion engines that are currently used on satellites. Well, imagine this, having a shell being made like a turtle shell, having food that is supplied from Earth or on the locations that you go to, and having cells that could produce ion propulsion. Now, you may say, that's really out there. But if you look at nature, we know that there are electric eels. We know that there are a lot of organisms that, are have, the, that have the potential to create electricity. We also know that when cells are exposed to space, most of them die. But also your skin, the top layer is dead. And that means that as the cells replicate, more cells die, and it's a continuous system. So the future doesn't just lie in the metal, but it also lies in what we are, in biology that will move us forward. Now, this is a way for us to explore other places, but it is also a way for the next wave here on Earth. It is the way that we, in our best ability, could sustain ourselves. I would like to thank you, but before ending, I would say that there's one statement that I always like to put forward. As you go forward and take your dreams and imaginations and push forward with them, remember this, that to make your dreams happen, you have to have imagination, you have to have persistence, but what is the most important thing is to have compassion. With compassion, we could all move forward. Thank you very much.